perfect thanks a lot again for uh, joining this conversation guy uh, i will quickly start with my introduction my name is rajat i hail from what is known as the silicon valley of india the city is called bangalore uh and i have around 3 and 1/2 years of experience in education technology and learning and development uh in multiple roles uh, starting from a product role and moved into a strategy and operations role at a, a very thriving st- startup here at in india and right now i'm working with this organization called nolscape uh, we provide simulation based learning for development of digital transformation executive leadership uh, and ai um and i am right now in the role of a inside sales associate but uh when it comes to uh me being in education technology for so long it is fair to say that uh my role essentially is that of a learning solution advisor uh to enterprise organizations looking to uh upskill their leaders in a faster and more efficient way uh which can be measured through our gamified and ai enabled solutions this is a little bit about me uh, if you do have any questions let me know else would love to start with your introduction uh, i already did go through your linkedin profile but would love to hear more about you yourself well i'll, I'll try to keep it short uh, my name is guy wallace i've been in the learning and development profession since 1979 so 45 years I'm uh, mostly retired although I just took on a project uh, the other day so I've kind of unretired now. Um my focus has been since the very beginning because on day 1 out of college in my new job I was taught a performance orientation to what was then called either instruction or training and nowadays it's known as learning. But uh, so I'm come from more of a focused narrowed educational perspective on training training people to be able to do their jobs so my focus is on job performance or process performance and organizational performance and trying to measurably impact the business metrics that uh, organizations use to gauge how well they're doing um i've been a consultant um since 1982 so at first i worked for a company wix lumber uh, i was a, se- a course developer then i went to motorola and i was a training project supervisor and then i joined a small consulting firm and became a partner and since then i've i've been an equity owner of three consulting firms the most recent uh, has been since uh, 2002 so 22 years in my pr- previous uh, uh my current role uh, as opposed to the number of years in the in the prior organizations thanks a lot that's a lot of experience uh can i just ask you uh what how how did you uh, determine that your focus needs to be into uh, learning and development space what caught your attention that you or decided to dedicate the entirety of your profession into it. Well, it was quite accidental. I have a radio TV film degree and I and I was working for Wix Lumber as a college student my last two and a half years uh, in getting my degree and they were uh, in the process of converting from 35 mm slides with an audio track that was how they delivered training to their 183 different uh, lumber centers across North America and uh, I had worked for three managers by at my two and a half year point and when they were at a management meeting and heard that this conversion to video was going to happen they all went to the vice president of human resources and insisted that they hire me so he was quite impressed that three managers came to him independently and suggested that they hire me into the department so I interviewed uh, went through the series of interviews and all that and was given a job and instead of putting me in the video part of the organization they made me a program developer a training program developer because I had field experience and I understood video and video production and all of our training was going to be video based and I was going to be able to help the 
the department, the three-person department that developed content work with the video people so that they could produce the videos that were were the mainstay, the major portion of how we were going to convey information and demonstrations. And then we would do practice exercises uh, in addition to the the video itself. But 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 that's I just fell into it and I loved it when I was studying uh, radio, TV and film. I wanted to go into educational television, but that was not available at my university and I was going to have to transfer to do that. And I decided not to go through the trouble of doing a transfer so close to my graduation. So I really fell into the business and uh, was taught a particular set of methods for uh, being performance-based or performance-oriented. And then I, when I went to Motorola, I got to work with the guy who, whose uh, performance orientation I had learned initially. And that guy was the late Gary Rumler, um, who was a thought leader in uh, instruction and training and learning uh, way back going into the early 60s. So I was quite fortunate in 1979 uh, to get into the field and in 1981 to join Motorola and get a chance to work with my guru. Lucky me. I know. That's a lovely story. So what I'm understanding, Guy, from what you just said is you found yourself in the middle of a technological transformation and you were able to leverage that to pursue what it is that you loved. Am I right? Uh, yes, I was able to use my knowledge of uh, video production, and so it was easier for me to see how the instruction that we were developing could be facilitated through the media of video. Right. Uh, over the last 40 odd years, just another question uh, to follow this up with. Uh, is there any other technological revolution uh, that you have come across that you think would be the next big wave in, say, the next 10 to 15 years? Uh, apart from, of course, the very generic AI terms that we are using, but any other technology that you may have come across or you find promising? Well, I, that's, I think, problematic to try to guess what the future will hold because I didn't necessarily foresee all of the technology, all the the digital technology transformation that's that's hit our field now the the one thing that's been a constant uh, change in the field is the digital technology that has enabled us to do our work to administrate our work and to deploy our work but the focus of performance based instruction whether you call it training or learning um, is pretty much the same it's the focus has got to be on what's the terminal performance of the learners. What is it they're supposed to do back on the job and how can we help them learn and master that using whatever means are appropriate. And those means, the, the media, the modes of learning that we might utilize uh, need to fit the constraints and the requirements of the learners and their organization. Fair enough. Uh, what do you think, according to you, is right now the most effective way of learning based solely based on your vast experience with all Fortune 500 clients? Well, quite frankly, learning on the job is the best. It's just not scalable. You, you don't necessarily have enough experts to work one-on-one -on -one with everybody that might need it. Now, in some cases where the target audience is small and people are hiring in one at a time, two at a time, that might be the best way to do that. But th one of the problems with that is that experts uh, have to, they have to over try to overcome um, non-conscious knowledge. Um, what the research shows is that 70% of the knowledge of an expert is not accessible to them. They can do the work, but they can't explain why and how they are doing it because they've automated it so it's also known as automated knowledge and so therefore when they are coaching a person one-on-one -on -one or a small group they can't share up to 70 percent of what those people need and so that's a huge issue but but through trial and error learning with a coach with a guide that's really the best way it's just not feasible because most of the time 
target audiences are larger and can't be addressed through a coach. It, that's just problematic. So in some cases that might be best, might be feasible, but in a lot of cases it's not. And therefore we need to figure out how to approach the learning of larger audiences. And I think there's some truth in this phrase. Uh, it's a blend. And so when we use e-learning, um, we can convey certain information, we can demonstrate the performance, we can demonstrate the uh, typical issues that need the barriers that need to be overcome and the strategies and tactics for that. But e-learning itself may not be uh, the best approach for my practice and giving me feedback. So if I'm going to practice something that I've been taught, I need both reinforcing feedback and corrective feedback, and then I need another chance to practice again based on the feedback that I've been given so that I do the things that are good and I avoid doing the things that are bad and have strategies and tactics for doing something other than the negative feedback uh, had shared with me. So it, it probably requires a blend and we need to look at learning as more than just a singular event. Uh, there's pre-work that can be done. There's learning uh, that, that has to happen. But then there's the post-formal learning where I'm going to learn back on the job. And either supervisors or peers have been uh, uh, helped and guided so that they can help me continue to learn on the job, or that's not sufficient. And if, it's, if I've been taught something that's not going to be used all of the time, I'm going to forget it. So we need spaced learning at times to help keep it uh, in my mind, in my capabilities so that I know it because I'm not going to remember everything that I learned in a formal learning experience unless I go to a job where that's reinforced every day, all day long. So if I learn how to do, do a sales uh, with a customer and I'm doing that 10, 12, 20, 30, 40 times a day, I'm going to get reinforced for that and i'm going to learn from what i do well and maybe what i do poorly uh depending on what how the feedback might work so the building every muscle situation is different and we need to as instructional uh developer types we need to understand what's that performance context what's the learner going to go back to and will they have the sufficient uh, supports back on the job to embrace what's been learned and not extinguish it, um, and to help that learner continue to improve and continue to learn back out on the job. Got it. Thank you. Uh, I think that answers quite a few uh, thoughts that I had uh, around how do we approach people in terms of talking about learning and development. Uh, before we move further into any other question I have, there are two words that caught my attention. If you could uh, break them down for me, which I found very intriguing. Uh, and I hope by the end of this call, I am able to uh, break that myth that uh, learning effectively on the job and with practice uh, is not scalable. That's the myth that our organization would want to break. And I'm very eager. I'm glad that the conversation started on this note because I'm very eager to show you what uh, the solution that we have. Uh, but again, coming back to those two words that you said, I think one was automated knowledge and the second was, I think, non-conscious learning. Uh, can you help me understand a little bit more on where these words are coming from and like, could you elaborate a little more on that? Sure. So the, uh, so the, the research has been done by many people, but, but the person that I learned this from, uh, Dr. Richard E. Clark, who's a professor emeritus from Southern California University, retired now, but uh, he's still pretty active. But he's done uh, 25, 30 years worth of research on uh, non-conscious knowledge. The fact that we have automated our knowledge. When we drive a car, we're not conscious of everything that we're doing. We have automated it. And so our, our, our inner consciousness knows what to do, but we couldn't tell somebody else exactly how we were thinking about something. So he's developed a methodology called CTA, critical task analysis, or excuse me, cognitive task analysis, where besides the behavioral tasks that we can all see and observe and measure when people are performing, 
we cannot see or observe or measure what they're thinking. And so this is a huge piece of most instruction that's often missing unless somebody has gone to the trouble to do something akin to a cognitive task analysis to begin to determine how should people think about the work that they're doing before they do it, while they're doing it, and after they do it to make sure that they're, you know, they've done it well enough to go on to the next step. So those are the things that have been automated. And when we use experts to teach, they are missing that. So the cognitive task analysis approach is to deal with multiple experts, five or six, some, sometimes less, but to because each of them knows a different 30% and has automated a different 70%. So if you work with enough of them, you can begin to build something closer to 100%. You'll probably not get 100% of the thinking that's necessary behind the doing of tasks. And so that's critical. So we teach people how to you know, do step one, two, three, four, five, but we haven't taught them how to think about that. Now, some experts, some subject matter expert that we're working with may be able to give us some of that thinking, but again, they've automated 70% of their thinking about the work, and so they cannot share that. You cannot force them to give it to you. They can't. They have automated it, and it's not accessible to them. This is what the research shows. So when we're constructing learning content, we need to work with more than one expert. This is a huge issue in our field in that we're often working with one subject matter expert and we're taking what they've given us as the, as if it's accurate, complete, and appropriate. And it may be accurate and it may be appropriate, but it's definitely not going to be complete because of this the nature of knowledge and, and non-conscious knowledge. And so we have to have strategies and tactics in our development processes to uncover that. And that's going to require that we work with more than one expert to give us the content. Does that help? Yes, it does. Uh, but just to make sure that I am understanding and I'm on the same page as what you explained to me. Uh, so if I have to summarize what you just said, uh, what you're essentially saying is the problem statement uh, that you're highlighting is complete knowledge transfer is not possible uh, by a single subject matter expert when it comes to any kind of training. Uh, this is because they have formed a muscle memory by doing it repeatedly, which uh, prevents them from critically thinking on the science of how they learned it. Uh, and thus, they can't communicate this to others. But if it is done in a peer-to-peer -peer environment, this can be achieved higher uh, than the average 30% is what you're saying. Have I gotten everything right or am well, I, I missing a few pieces? I don't know that the peer-to-peer -peer is is the answer because the peer-to-peer, -peer, the, the person who's conveying the information, the instruction, the learning, they're subject to the, uh, unless they have uh, worked with others to fill in their gaps, their own automated knowledge, if they have not done that, then they're subject to not only being able to give people 30% of what they need in terms of the cognitive tests, the thinking tests. Now, the research also shows that somewhere between 45 and 60% of the behavioral tasks, the expert can tell you. This is step one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. How you think about doing step two, which might be tricky, they can give you some of it, but they can't give you all the thinking. So you have to get, you have to use as sources multiple experts in order to backfill what's missing from the individual. And so if you use two experts, you're gonna do a little bit better, three or four, even better. About five or six is where you're gonna to top out according to the research and you may only get 85% of what the learner needs. Now, the learner will then go to the job and through trial and error, through application, through getting feedback one way or another, they may backfill that missing 15% themselves by figuring it out back on the job. So our instruction is always good. My rule is always that my instruction is gonna be incomplete. How do I make it more complete, better? How do I do that? 
Who do I have to work with? How do I have to test out my instruction to see if I can find the holes before we deploy it? And so the strategy that, that I've used uh, throughout my career is that after development, we would do pilot testing. Now, many people's models for, you know, an addy like thing, you do analysis, then you do design, then you do development. Well, in the development phase is where we would do alpha and beta and pilot testing, if you will, where we'll try to figure out what's missing and then fix it before we release it, before we deploy it. So in my own approach to this, I have, created a phase after development called pilot testing so that I could uh, show my clients how important that was and begin to talk to them about the nature of non-conscious knowledge, how that if we don't test it, we're going to release something to the market that's going to be incomplete. And if it's low stakes performance, well, that's no big deal. If it's really high stakes performance, high risks and rewards, that's quite problematic to, to train people to have them learn something and to know darn well that what you've given them is incomplete. What's missing? Is that going to be dangerous to the individual? Is that going to be dangerous to the organization and our reputation? Or, or you know, what, what, what's the root issue underneath all of that? So, so making a big deal about the pilot testing helped my clients see that we would go through analysis, we would design our instruction, we would develop it, and we would do what I call alpha and beta testing. And then we would do a full-blown, let's try to break it, pilot test. Let's see if we can find the holes of our in our instruction through rigorous pilot testing. And, and you know, my thing is that if we can break it, let's break it. Let's break it now so we can fix it before we release it. And some clients have tolerance for that. They understand it. They get it. Other clients don't have any tolerance for that. And so they didn't want to pilot test. I would say that, well, okay, then the very first delivery, the very first deployment, that will be the pilot test. And so we want to do special evaluations for the people that go through the very first uh, partaking of the learning and to see if they can help us find the holes. So rather than just the feedback. give the training, the, the learning to new hires, Let's give it to some experienced people too, because they might, the new hire is not going to be able to tell us what's missing, but the experienced people might be able to do that. Well, sometimes clients don't even like that. So, but they live, the clients live with the consequences of training that's complete or incomplete. And so it's a business decision as to how hard you work at making sure that your instruction is complete enough. It doesn't have to be perfect unless we're dealing with you know nuclear power plants and then we you know better be darn perfect but but for most jobs it doesn't have to be that perfect we just have to do it well so that we don't cause problems for the learner their processes their customers their stakeholders uh, when they go back to the job so that's the tr that's the trickiness of that thank you that answers my question uh I'm going to follow up again, just building upon that. I know we have a bunch of uh, questions that you already have answers for, uh, but I just want to build a little bit more on it to get more depth into understanding of uh, just the market insights, right? Uh, so my follow up is one, it's a two part question. Uh, the first question being, uh, do you have any comment on the current feedback loop uh, that organizations, and here I'm, Speaking specifically with respect to the organizations I'm uh, looking for, which are, again, small and medium enterprises across the United States, uh, company size being anywhere between 500 to up to 10,000. Uh, a lot of them have already been your clients, so I think you'd be one of the best persons to answer this question. One is uh, any comments on the feedback loop itself? Uh, and the second question being, uh, you have something to say? No, no, no. Go ahead. What's the second part? Yeah. My second part is, uh, what are some of the clear and noticeable challenges uh, that you observe during either online or offline delivery or what you call deployment of so th these trainings? All right, so the, the feedback loop. So the so my most of my clients throughout my career, I've had 80 some clients, are were generally, but not always, fortune, one to to five hundred uh, to one hundred companies, so mostly large companies. But just the size of the company was independent of 
who what the size of the target audience that I was dealing with. So I've dealt with in big companies with target audiences that are just hundreds of people or 1100 people or thousands of people. So I I don't know that 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 changes anything because what's really most important is not the size of the target audience. It's the size of the impact that you can have. Um, it's the size of the problem or opportunity that you're addressing and, and how you help your clients address that. And again, I'm trying to get people to perform in business processes better, faster, and cheaper. And so that's the thing. Uh, regarding trends, you know, I, I come from a school of thought from back in 1979 and 1980, where many of the thought leaders were against prevailing trends. They because sometimes trends take us off in the wrong direction. So there was a trend um, to focus on behaviors back in the 70s and early 80s. And one of my thought leader gurus was a guy named Tom Gilbert. And he wrote a book in 1978 titled Human Competence. And in that book, he bemoaned the cult of behaviors because too often, people in our field were addressing behaviors uh, without understanding that behaviors are a means to the end. So what's the end or ends that we're trying to achieve? And then the behaviors either make sense or don't. And behaviors for the most part are, are need to be variable. Sometimes I need to be happy. Sometimes I need to be angry. Sometimes I need to be uh, understanding and sympathetic. Sometimes I have to ignore that and be more directive. And so we need to understand the performance context and what we're trying to achieve, what outputs we're trying to produce, what services we're trying to render, what's the performance context, is our, our clients happy or are they mad at us? And so how we behave is a variable and we need to teach it thusly to match the performance context requirements. And but too often we teach behaviors as if it's a one, one all be all. That's it. That's how you should be. Well, that's not necessarily true. Now there are cases, of course, where where it is. So that was one of the trends early on. <clears throat> a second trend that came shortly after that was a focus on competencies, which are normally generalized statements of capability or competence, what how whatever terminology you want to use. But again, those were often addressed without understanding the context that people have to perform in. Nowadays, the trend is skills. There's a mania about skills and skills development, and we provide content that addresses those skills, but we don't provide content that's been narrowed and focused on a specific context. And so, our content is too often sans context. It's missing the context and the context is everything in terms of what's the appropriate knowledge required, the skills, the behaviors, the competencies is really dependent on understanding that performance context. And many people don't work in one co performance context they work in, in a sales situation. Sometimes they want to hear from you because they want to buy. Sometimes they are interested in hearing from you, but they're not too sure. Sometimes they already have another vendor and you would have to displace them. Those are three contexts and how a salesperson addresses those are different. Now, so there's some general truths and general things that they should be taught how to do, but they have to understand what their varied response might be to a varied situation. They may go in expecting one thing, find another, and now they've got to change, they've got to shift their behaviors to match what they've encountered in the performance context. So that's that's really critical. I, and I hope that helps because I think that that's, you know, we can get caught up in trends and you know, you could talk about artificial intelligence and I think it's a great thing if it's used correctly. Um, you can develop content on it, but you're going to have to do the alpha and beta and pilot testing to make sure it, it hasn't hallucinated something that's erroneous. Absolutely. Um, and it can help us with design, too. It can learn design patterns and help us speed, accelerate our way through design so that we can get into development. Um, it might even be able to help us do some of the analysis. 
the cognitive task analysis Definitely. that I was talking about earlier, uh, there was an effort at the University of Southern California years ago to use artificial intelligence to automate cognitive task analysis, how to interview five or six different experts to find out what was common between them and what was different between them. And if those differences were contrary to what somebody else had said, or whether they just filled a hole in the con uh, the content that was being gathered. So artificial intelligence, I think, is going to be something that's going to have major impact on us. Uh, perhaps there's a little bit too much mania about it right now, but I think it's it's the future. It's going to be a tool. It's going to be a tool that's going to far surpass, you know, what search capabilities on the internet did for us in developing content. Um, but right now I see most of AI helping us with educational content. You want to learn about active listening? We can teach you everything that there is to know about active listening because we can use artificial intelligence to use it. But artificial intelligence doesn't necessarily know my learners targeted performance requirements and the context which they have to apply it in. So I can do overkill with my content, giving the learner more than they need. I might even miss giving them exactly what they need because artificial intelligence may not have understood my unique context that my learning is supposed to cover. And so it will get better over time. It will improve. It will become a very valuable tool. But right now, it, it doesn't do everything that we might need it to do. It could help us project plan. It may not help us do all the analysis that we need. It may help us do design. It may help us do development. But we have to be careful about how we use that because if what we're addressing has high stakes for our clients, if we give them content that's incomplete or has errors, that can significantly impact our relationship in the marketplace, our reputation in the marketplace. And so we have to be very careful about doing that. So again, it goes back to, are we testing what we're producing adequately before it gets used? Um, and this has been an issue since I first got into the business. The, the late Bob Mager, Robert F. Mager, a famous guru in the learning field back in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, what, you know, this was one of the things he would always talk about at conferences, the need for us to do adequate testing to prove that what we have produced actually has an impact and doesn't have any negatives associated with it. Thanks again, Guy. Uh, again, I will try to shorten what I understood. Uh, and you can again correct me and add or omit if I'm getting anything wrong. Uh, my understanding from everything that you shared so far is uh, we can define a successful learning program uh, on these four metrics if, if we are able to measure them correctly. Those be uh, focus on competencies, focus on skills. Uh, these being two and the other two which uh, define the success of any kind of training or learning program, uh, which are key to, of course, I would say com competencies and skills being uh, the secondary things to focus on. But the main things to focus on is context and practicing. Is that fair to say? Yes. So there's the so there's so I want to practice performing tasks to produce outputs or to render services. So there's a. People are on the payroll not to perform tasks, but to produce worthy things that are worthy to downstream customers that meet the regulatory requirements, et cetera. So we need to focus on the ends before we focus on the means. Learning is a means to an ends. Learning helps me perform tasks. But what am I trying to produce with those tasks? A storyboard, a script, a final video? Do we understand what what does a good video look like? What's a good script or storyboard look like? Um, and are we are we helping people to learn how to perform tasks effectively and efficiently to produce those outputs? So, and when those outputs meet the stakeholder requirements, that's a good outcome. If they don't meet the stakeholder requirements, that's a poor outcome. And so we need to understand that both outputs and tasks 
are measured by stakeholders. Uh, regulatory agencies are one stakeholder. Sometimes they care about the output, the product, and sometimes they don't. They care about the tasks and how it was done. Was it done safely? We don't care about what you produced. We care about how you produced it. And some stakeholders care about both the output and the tasks. So we need to understand all of the stakeholders, what their requirements are, because we're trying to help people learn how to perform, to produce things that meet all the stakeholder requirements. Because if you satisfy the downstream customer, but you violated the regulations, well, that's just no good. And so you've got to satisfy the downstream customer. You've got to satisfy the regulators. You've got to satisfy your peers that are you're working with so that you don't uh, create an unsafe working condition. You've got to do this in such a way that the shareholders don't lose money. You, so there's a lot of stakeholders that we need to be uh, considering while we're doing our development because we have to help learners become performers who are competent in doing their job tasks and producing worthy outputs that will lead to positive outcomes. Wonderful. I think that's a wonderful explanation uh, to what I asked. Thanks a lot. Uh, guys. Can we now move to the business end of the conversation in terms of uh, why I wanted to speak with you and uh, what is it that I uh, need help with? Uh, is it sure. okay if we start with that? Yes. Uh, so to set some context, uh, Nolescape is a 15-year-old organization that builds simulations uh, for learning and training and development. We are present in uh, operational in five countries and we've had more than, uh, I think we've worked near with nearly all Fortune 500 clients in the last decade or so. Uh, and uh, our USP essentially being uh, the experience that we are able to create at scale with the technology of simulations. When I say simulations, I essentially mean uh, a gamified solution to uh, win over or learn a competency. Uh, I think I'll be able to uh, explain more in detail about this when we go to the demo part of the conversation. But before that, I'd like to have uh, so. Uh, I am I'm hired by the organization uh, to uh, get some face time and to crack the US market, uh, which is the mid market, the 500 to 10,000 uh, headcount companies. Uh, I would love to get any kind of insight uh, that you may have for me in terms of how do I approach it. Uh, we have been doing this for the last three months and I would be happy to share with you uh, what are the things that we have tried so far and what has worked and what has not, but would love to hear from you uh, more in terms of how do we build uh, effectively effective uh, business relationship with Americans in the L&D enterprise space, if that's a fair question to ask you. Well, again, uh, so I think uh, um, regardless of the size of the company, I think it's all about your value proposition. So what are you promising? You're going to give them some learning. So what? Is it going to help me? Can you prove it? Have you? Can you show me numbers from previous projects that you've done that will help, that will give me confidence that you guys know what you're doing? So if you're building a simulation-based, gamified-based instruction learning, um, what have been the results? Are you... Are you focus, Are you measuring your impact? Do you know what, what the numbers were for quality, quantity, and cost, or better, faster, and cheaper before you started? And what, were, what are the numbers afterwards? And how can I calculate a return on investment? Not everything in, in terms of the returns are dollarizable or monetary, but, but can you talk to me about that? Because why should I spend $1,000 if I'm only going to get 900 back? Can I? Can you show me where I can spend a thousand dollars and I'm going to get ten thousand dollars back? And how do you go about doing that? So if the value proposition is uh, a significant return on investment, because most companies need to be thinking about their sh their spending, investing shareholder equity. What are they getting for that? 
So not every uh, effort, every learning and development in, uh, effort is needs to show a return on investment. Sometimes people just know that we got new hires, we got to explain the company and what business we're in and who we're doing com business with and who are suppliers and things like that. We need, they need to be oriented to you know who we are and what we do for a living here. So that's a no-brainer and measuring return on investment for something like that is, is not really good. But if I'm targeting specific job titles and helping people with that job title perform better, that's good. If I'm giving you content on general topics, general knowledge, general behaviors, general skills, um, that's very different. Now, what I would do in a situation like that, one of the things I've written about uh, numerous times over the past decade is I would bookend that content. You know, I can have some generic content on active listening or spreadsheets um, and I can learn that. But if I don't understand how to apply it in my work, then that's where it falls short. I get formal learning and then now I have to go through informal learning, trial and error, social learning, whatever, in order to figure out how to apply spreadsheets in my job. No one told me how to do that. And, and maybe it's easy to figure out in some cases and maybe it's not so easy. Maybe figuring out how to use what I learned about active listening is not so easy. And therefore, I don't really use it, which means the, the entire effort was a waste of shareholder equity. We have squandered shareholder equity. So the value proposition that I would want to go with is that we're going to help you make investments for significant returns. We're going to do that by helping you understand the performance context and what people need to be able to do and what they need to know in order to be able to do to meet the requirements in their performance context. And we're going to help sort the wheat from the chaff. We're going to figure out what's really critically important, what are the high risks and rewards versus the medium risks and rewards versus the low stakes uh, risks and rewards. And we're going to help you focus on those things that have significant leverage to performance of business processes so that people and their processes can be performing better, faster, and cheaper. Um, and then it's a business decision by the client to actually undertake a project to help people learn to perform better so that their business processes go better. So rather than the value proposition about, well, we can build content for you quickly and cheaply. It should be, we can help you figure out what content you need in order to improve your business. And I, I, so I think that that's the value proposition. There's a lot of people and, and different vendors in the space, if you will. Yes. Um, and yes. so you're competing against them. If you don't give me a compelling reason as to why I should go with you versus anybody else, then you, you, you're you not necessarily going to win my business unless there's some other reason why I'm going to choose you. But you're competing with everybody else. So your value proposition to me has to far exceed what everybody else is offering because everybody's offering instructional learning content. And well, so what? Um, and you can offer it to me cheaper. But if I'm a smart business person, I'm going to want to know, well, why do I want to even make that investment? Why do I want even cheap stuff unless I can see how it's going to help me? So, again, one of the things that I've suggested to clients is that they can take generic educational content and bookend it. Uh, active listening in for one job is different than another job. The front end bookend has got to explain why the learner needs to learn this, what's in it for them, what's in it for the company what's it all about, and then they can go take the generic content. On the back end, we need to provide sufficient practice with feedback, with corrective and reinforcing feedback, and, and additional rounds of practice so that the learner can learn active listening unique to their context, because that's what's often missing from you know, generic libraries of content. And, and so I think when you if you're doing simulations and gamifying learning, I think that what needs to be simulated and what needs to be gamified is my application of active listening or spreadsheets. Gamify that. Uh, uh, simulate that. Help me learn how to apply content 
and and give me feedback of how well I did and what I needed to do improve, and then let me try it again and again until I'm sufficiently prepared to go back to the job and continue applying and learning from learning while working. So the value proposition to me has got to be more than just, I can give you content. We, we, we've done it a lot of times. I want to know, so what? what? What's been the impact of you doing that with your clients? And if you can share with me some success stories and tell me about the project, tell me a story about the project. How did it start? How did you do it? What were the results? Um, then I might be more inclined to want to listen more, to maybe do a trial project with you. Um, but in, but if, if you're not differentiating yourself from the masses of sources for instructional content, then it's going to be much harder to do. And I think that that's, you know, a lot of people are making these offerings. Individuals are doing it. Small companies, big companies are doing it. How do you differentiate yourself from all the rest of the uh, providers? Because I, I, as a customer, have alternatives. I've got many alternative sources for getting my learning needs met. And so you have to, in that herd of alternatives, you have to stand out some way and convince me that you know what you're doing and can help me meet my needs, whatever they might be. Thanks a lot. Uh, I th thanks a lot. Uh, can I make a comment at this? Please. Uh, so the goal of every coming back into our reality of the discussion where we started off from, uh, essentially the goal of a simulation is to engage critical thinking uh, for any learner so that they can uh, take a data driven and a very recognized decision uh, that's basically the core competency that uh, the simulation is trying to achieve uh, but what is more important is how again the peer-to-peer -peer or the discussion in itself uh, takes place so if you reflect on the last 20 minutes of our conversation uh, you would realize that you had deeply engrossed in the simulation in terms of what is the decision that you took and you were able you were you took some time to justify all of that uh during our discussion right when you were giving me the feedback itself uh at this point uh, i would want you to comment on uh having this information to your attention right now i would like to comment i would like you to comment on the methodology used in terms of uh, the simulation being uh, used as a mode of delivery to enable learning. Uh, do you think it is more effective than just video content? If yes, can you share more details in terms of uh, how do I make it more appealing and compelling to my target audience? All right, so let me uh, do something here. I'm going to grab a magic book for me, which I'm going to have all the answers I need. Um, Interpersonal so, communication skills development. Yeah, so this is, uh, so I believe in simulations. In fact, um, so my whole, my model for instructional design is information, demonstration, application. So info, demo, apo. And the application, the best is real work. Uh, tell guy what he needs to know show him what it looks like now have him do some real work oh no we can't do that that's not feasible all right so let's simulate real work and so simulations is critical and you can gamify that by scoring it and and doing the the gamification kind of factors but but simulating uh the work um whether it's you know manufacturing work uh rather rote or whether it's more dynamic, like a sales situation where he's simulating the simulation, the sales, uh, a, a sales call, which, you know, you start off trying to do something and then something changes because the, the person you're trying to sell to is, is open to hear you, doesn't want to hear you, wants to throw you out of, you know, so you have to deal with those dynamic situations. So 
simulations and that's and i learned the my approach to simulations uh from neil rackham who is the author of spin selling and i worked with i had an opportunity to work with him at motorola and i saw the simulations that they used in spin selling and spin selling was the number one uh business book for a number of years i mean it's and uh and i and i so i've known neil for a number of years and i i got a chance to work with his company huthway at the time um and their win-win negotiation program and the simulations they had built on that so everything i know about simulations i stole from him and his uh his uh partners um and so simulations are really critical and the toughest kind of simulation to create is one where there's you're using interpersonal skills where you're communicating it's one thing for me to simulate me creating a storyboard all by myself you know that's i we can simulate that and have people do that the toughest simulations are where we're dealing with interpersonal skills where there's more people involved in the process that we're focused on and so that's that's what my book is about interpersonal uh, communication skills development and how to use simulations for that but what what i've learned about simulation is transferable to um other um uh, situations but you know in the thing you're you're dealing with is that there's communications you're getting something that says the batch was bad what do i do um that could have been done through emails and not an interpersonal skills but but you're communicating back to what you're going to do right. letting that customer know that yeah we got your message this is what we're going to do and how you articulate that and, and put that in writing for an email to send back to them to uh, to let them know that you've heard it and what you're going to do about it um, or what you can and cannot do about it is is critical. Um, so I really so I start with simulations for the things that are really critical. We should simulate them and have that be a practice exercise and we should do it more than once. Now I, you know, for 45 years, your clients have said more than once, why we shouldn't do it? Well, yeah, because, you know, did, did so what I saw Neil Rackham do to my clients at Motorola, mm -hmm. uh, they were manufacturing people. He said, do you guys play golf or tennis? And they all said, oh yeah, sure we did. And he goes, so have you ever had a lesson? Oh yeah, sure we have. And he said, so did they ever change your grip? And every <laughs> one of them said, yes, I, I had a poor grip. And he goes, so when you had the new grip and you practiced it, what happened to the ball? And they go, oh, it went this way and that way and everything but right. And he said, so what did you do? Did you continue to use the new grip that the tennis coach or golf coach had showed you how to use? Or did you revert back to the old one because you had better control with the old grip than the new grip? And they all went quiet because they knew that he had gotten them because we all tend to regress to what we had been doing before because we kind of it kind of worked for us not well enough but yeah. but the new group so he said the role of a coach is to reinforce the behavior despite the uh, results because the results initially will be poorer than when you started and the coach has to say, guy, now change your, you, you, you change the grip, get back to the right grip. Okay, now the ball went back. Do it again, do it again, do it again. Pretty soon, the results improve and become reinforcing of the new behavior. And, and so when he told my clients at Motorola that they understood why Guy was always asking for more than one practice exercise, um, they all of a sudden understood that, yeah, to reshape people's behavior their performance we need to give them more than one shot one and done exercises is an issue simulating the real world the tennis ball the golf ball the sales call simulating that as close to the authentic situation is best and it's the performance that we need to give feedback on um, recognizing the right grip is one thing seeing what i actually did is another and again that's me recalling okay the stance the grip the because it's more complicated you know there's many things that you know 
golfers and 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 people who play tennis you know realize that you know it's not just one thing it's not just the grip it's a whole bunch of other things too and all in combination okay. but you work on one thing at a time so i i think that that the the simulations are the way to go the simulations that you have there in in what you showed me um we didn't see the information uh to say but you know that had to really tell me this is right this is wrong here's why uh in this situation here's how it looks how in this situation that's how it looks so now let's you know go to the video and watch you know something being done and maybe we we show somebody doing it wrong and then we want to show somebody doing it right and then right. debrief Poor on prediction. that yeah and have and then have me do it and the you know uh, being customer centric it, it, you can orient that to performance and you did in the in this in the situation that uh, i read and uh, uh, chose the wrong answer to um but but so if you're doing your design and development backwards one of the things i learned back in the first days of in the job was you build the test first then you build the practice exercises then you basically decide whether or not you need a demo because has the learner seen this before uh, you know or is this all brand new to them so if it's brand new to them yeah they need to see it if they've been in the job for a long time the a demo might be insulting to them because they've been there and done it and seen it so that's that, that's not yeah. necessarily always good. it's the information that we give them the a shortest smallest amount of information that will make them successful in the application exercise and the other thing i was taught was that the last application exercise can be considered a test or not but the test and the practices need to be, basically be the very same thing one of them is called the final test but they're all a test right. of whether i learned it and can do it the first time get better the second time the third time etc um so i think that you know the tool the system that you showed me i think has a lot of promise there is and there's a time and a place for uh quizzing me through recognition versus recall but ideally you would eventually get to where one of the practice exercises was a blank slate and i had to fill it in i had to recall what i'd learned so if i had seen uh several different uh, scenarios where uh i was given the opportunity to be customer centric or not um and and was and part of that was the multiple choice kind of a decision at the end picking the right answer later on at some point i really should demonstrate that i can recall what to do versus recognize what to do and that would be my my only feedback here so um uh, simulations are good uh scoring them and all of that is good keeping them narrow is is best um not giving me too much feedback if you give me feedback on eight different things it's all going to get lost i really need to yeah. get feedback on one thing before i'm ready to go on and learn something else and new so we didn't really look at the feedback portion mm -hmm. of that in the report and how many th things i was going to get but giving me too many just you know it is too much it overwhelms me and i cannot internalize all of that so the point of feedback is to help me improve and that should be improve a narrow one thing if you will at a time maybe two at the most but basically it should be fairly narrow uh and this is the whole issue of chunking the instruction to smaller things now it, it, there's right. no magic number in terms of how much time or or pages or screens that's going to take it depends on the whole task because i'm doing several tasks to produce an output and maybe the focus is on task number two and then we'll have another uh, focus on task number four because one and three are kind of easy and simple and it'd be an insult to have you practice those two but two and four is where we need to give guy the learner practice but we should give him number two and give them feedback on that and a chance to reply that feedback and then give focus on four and give them feedback and a chance to do that again and then we maybe have them do another exercise where there's both two and four so now i'm i'm interleaving two and four together if you will 
to, and that strengthens my learning when I'm not just focused on one thing alone, when I have to learn and then have a opportunity to learn something else and then go back to the first thing. So interleaving is kind of tricky because it can be overwhelming and we've always got to be conscious of the cognitive load that we've loaded on the learner because at some point they've just, you know, it's, it's just overflow. It just, they've, they've taken in all they can and they can't take in any more. And if we continue to feed them more information, um, it's all going to get lost. So how we chunk our content depends on what is to be learned and what the prior knowledge of the learner is coming into the situation. Because if it's brand new to them, they're going to be limited. If it's very familiar to them and you're kind of, this is kind of like refresher, then I can learn, take on more. Uh, and we need to understand that about our, our target audiences and the personas that we might do. Here's somebody, it's all brand new to them. They don't know anything about this. Here's somebody who knows quite a bit about it because they worked in a job that's related to this, but they never did it before themselves. Well, that's a more familiar situation and they've got actually prior knowledge coming in the door than somebody who's coming in off the street and has never seen any of this before. Got it. So everything that you have shared in terms of feedback uh, on the platform or on simulations as a technology itself, uh, I think all of that is addressed in our uh, LMS in one way or, or the other, whether it's with respect to feedback or it's with respect to uh, practicing again, the repetition of practicing. Uh, and maybe I was not able to portray it in the best way possible, but if I give you access to this simulation, would you be open to actually playing the game and giving me uh, even more detailed feedback in terms of the effectiveness of uh, the simulation itself? Would you be open to doing that? Well, I I don't know. My time is limited here. I, I, I have the things to do, so I'm not sure that the, I'm the right person to do that for. I'm not your your target audience, so I think that you right. need to you need to to do that with people who are more representative of your target audience. Fair um, enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Thank you. Uh, coming to the target audience, now that you understand to a certain degree what our solution is, who our target audience is, can, uh, so if you were to uh, market simulations as a solution to enterprises in this time and age, could you tell me from your experience, what would what would what were the what are the actionables that you would take uh, to uh, reach out in terms of communication and in terms of uh, closing deals? Yeah, so I think that you know when you go to market, you I, I would not, and I don't know you know if this is consistent or inconsistent with what your business plan is, but if you can customize those types of simulations so that they are more and more authentic to my needs. So if you come to me with a bunch of uh, pre-done programs, Preset, yeah. that's different. If you can customize that to the type of product we're in, and services we're really dealing with, um, and so the situation has become closer, more near transfer than far transfer, so that that what I'm learning is really looks, feels, and smells just like our real work. So the go-to-market strategy that I would want to employ is I need to get in the front of the customer and say that I can improve performance. And if we pick the right performance to improve, we can have a significant impact to the return on investment. And we would do that by be, quickly because you know you need to do analysis, but you've got to avoid analysis paralysis. So you've got to figure out where are the significant things that for a customer that could be addressed and should be addressed and how to determine what are the things that I need to get out of their real world so that I can uh, modify my simulation exercises so that it's much more authentic to what they're doing. Um, you know, this is about near transfer, far transfer stuff doesn't really transfer well. Now it depends on the prior knowledge of the individual learning it because they might have an ex experience. They may have learned things through education and experience that helps them 
take something that's further away transfer wise and figure it out and make it near transfer for them. Whereas the next person, it's far transfer and it won't transfer because it's too far away from what they've really got to do. Here I go back to the job and now I've got to, I've learned these things, but I can't figure out how to apply them. I'll, I'll skip it. I'll revert and go back to my old grip. I'll go do things the way I used to do. Now, if I'm a new hire, I'm just lost because I didn't have another uh, way, an old way of doing this. I don't know. So I'll be fumbling and stumbling around. And so depending on who the audience is, incumbent populations or brand new new hires, that's different. But the go-to-market strategy, I think, is about I'm going to I'm I'm here to give you learning that's going to improve performance. Um, sometimes learning won't affect performance because your process is broken and you know all the learning in the world isn't going to fix that for the people trapped in a bad process it's just not and so we can help you figure out whether or not learning is part of the solution or not or whether there's other environmental factors like fix the process fix the consequence system people are behaving unsafely because the supervisors are forcing them to so it's not the performers, it's their supervisor that needs to be trained and monitored and given feedback about what they're doing. So we can help you figure out whether or not learning is appropriate and can have impact or not. And if it is part of the solution that you need, we can make sure that it's authentic enough that people will learn things that will transfer back to the job. And we can figure out when spaced learning will help because what we've taught them to do doesn't come up all the time. And so it's going into cold storage is the language that we used to use back in the 70s and 80s. It's gone into cold storage. And when we try to get it out, it's it's no good. And, and we, we've forgotten it. So we need to be have reinforcement that space learning uh, appropriately so that when the situation demands me responding performance wise, I will have it available because I've been through space learning that's kept me conscious of it. And it's not automated and gone and lost, you know, because we can't remember everything that we've he ever heard. And so how do we keep the most critical things uh, consciously available to the performer to use? Now, if they're doing it all the time, they're gonna automate it and it's not gonna be consciously available to them, but they're gonna be able to do it. But you ask them to explain it to the next person, they're not going to be able to because, and they're going to be, they'll confidently do that, but it'll be missing a lot of content. And, you know, a, another expert might listen to Guy explain something and say, Guy, you missed three things there. Here they are. And I, Guy might say, oh, you're right. Yeah, good point. Um, because that was part of what I automated and they didn't. Um, and so it's, you know, it's tricky dealing with, with this performance stuff. And so, the go-to-market strategy has got to be how we will help people improve through these mechanisms that we use in our projects. We've got content. We're not suggesting we give it to you. It's all ready to go right now. Sometimes it could be, but really critical performance probably isn't something that you've already created, but you might have something that's close and can be modified quickly to give them a solution right now or you know very soon. And, and so that's, I think, the the fact that you, if you could promise performance improvement and you could do it quickly and not cost an arm and a leg, but do it for, at a reasonable price, consistent with the risk. I mean, if I've got a problem that's costing me a million dollar a quarter, what's it worth to me to say to solve that? Should I spend a million dollars if it's costing me a million dollars a quarter? Because after all, I'll be $3 million of good at the end of the year because I've solved a million dollar problem and I don't have that in quarter two, three, and four. So how you help clients come to that recognition that's, you know, the investment and the payback, you know, how much will I get paid back? How soon will I break even and then be to the good? Those are all part of, I think, the go-to-market strategy is how you position yourself uh, in this herd of vendors, because lots of people are doing, you know, learning, e-learning, and a number of people are doing simulations and you know, what makes you different and your approach different and why should I choose you out of all of my alternatives? That's the that's the thing that needs to be answered to the prospect. Yeah.
my next question is very fairly simple. Uh, I don't have simple answers, however. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. I, I, I will try. Uh, if the answer was simple, then everybody would be doing it. Uh, my my question my this my next question is fairly simple. Uh, how price sensitive is the American buyer? I I think as a general rule, you have to assume that everybody is price sensitive. They may have a number in their head. They may have a number from another uh, provider that they've got, and you have to compete against that. One of the goals. Um, that one of the things I learned from people in the total quality management movement back in 1981 was that people think about the price of the solution. And one of the things that you as a vendor or me as a consultant have to do is get them to figure out what's the value of the problem or opportunity. Because if I told you, well, the price is a million dollars, that's way too much. Not if you've got a $20 million a year problem, it's not. And so uh, the quality movement called it the cost of conformance. What's it gonna cost? And this is the I in ROI, the investment cost. What's the cost of conformance? What's it gonna take to fix that? A million dollars, that's a lot. What's the cost of non-conformance? What's it cost to live with that problem? What's the return that we can get? If you can get rid of a $20 million a year problem for the cost of a million dollars, the million dollars doesn't look so bad anymore. It looks like it's a bargain. So knowing that people are price sensitive, one of the things that the spin sales methodology teaches you, it's about situation, the problems within the situation, uh, or the opportunities within the situation, flip sides of the same coin. What's the implication of that uh, problem or opportunity? Is that a million dollar problem, uh, a dollar problem, a 10 cent problem? So what you're looking for is those things that are problems or opportunities with significant implications. And then the end, the needs payoff in the spin model is, so if I, if I Socratically walked you through your situation, your problems and opportunities, the implications, then I hit you with the needs payoff. So if I could solve that $20 million a year problem or opportunity for you for a million dollars, uh, do you think we, we should explore that? And somebody's gonna say, I can invest 1 million and save $20 million. Well, yeah, because if I don't do anything, it's costing me $20 million. And so the, the goal is to Socratically lead the, the prospect to the point to where they see what the value is of their situation as is. If I don't do anything, it's costing me $20 million a year. If I don't do something, I'm gonna miss that $20 million opportunity. So problem or opportunity. So now the price, you'll be less sensitive about the price because you've shifted the sensitivity from price sensitivity to problem sensitivity. And what's the cost of that problem? And so that was, one of the things that I learned back from Neil Rackham, besides simulation, so now how do we create simulations to get salespeople to tease out the spin, the, the, the situation, the problems, the implications, and the needs payoff? How do they set that up so that the prospect doesn't feel manipulated? So if you're going to go to market, you need to basically help clients understand where are their significant rewards or risks? for them to address and what can we do about it? Do we need to change the process? Do we need to change the consequence system? Do we need to change the tools? Do we need to change what people know and not promise that learning is a solution to every issue that comes up because it's not. But if you change the tool, you probably have to train people on the new tool. If you change the process, you probably have to train people on the new process. So. Training is often, instruction learning is often involved in a solution set. But if you're only doing that one thing, can you help them figure out what else is going on in what we're targeting? The significant problem or opportunity with huge implications. So the, so the salespeople, I think, need to go in there and work with customers to find out what are the significant things going on here? And can we begin to 
strategize on whether or not learning is it could be a part of the solution or could be the solution. You know, I'm starting up a new product line. I'm bringing in a whole bunch of new people. Well, they're going to need to be trained. And and so um, that, that's a different situation than dealing with the current state problems or opportunities that people have. So the sales people have to go in there with the value proposition that we're all about improving performance. We do that through learning. And when learning isn't part of the solution, we tell you that so that you don't waste your money and time. And maybe you'll need us for the next thing. So that was one of the hardest things I recall uh, that salespeople struggled with is them saying, well, let's see, I've, we've done the spin exercise, not telling anybody that, but, but we did it. And I've concluded that I can't help you. Well, salespeople don't ever say that, but that's what they needed to say. You're, you need to really look at these other aspects and what I have to sell you isn't going to help you. And I, you know, I wouldn't feel good about myself pushing something on you that is not useful. Well, now I've built, maybe built trust and maybe there'll be another opportunity for me with them later on. But if this is not the time and place to sell learning into an organization for whatever we were talking about, then that's what I should do. I should forego this and walk away. I, it, their negotiations program was called win-win negotiations, but their spin selling training could have been called win-win selling. The customer wins and we win. But if the customer is going to lose and we win, well, that's no good for a long-term relationship. So if I want to have long-term relationships with my customers, and hopefully that customer will go to one of their friends, that prospect will say, hey, they came in and they told me that, you know, they wanted to sell stuff to me, but but I didn't need it. Who does that? And I tell my friends and they hire you, you know. So when I'm going to market, I have to worry about my reputation. I can sell stuff that doesn't do anybody any good. And eventually that's going to catch up with me. So doing so when you do work with a client and you do good work, you need to ask them for testimonials <clears throat> that you can use to sell. You need to ask them, can I tap into your network uh, with other people who are potential prospects, buyers of my uh, products and services. And if I've done good work with you, because this has happened to me a lot of times, um, where my work has come in the door because of somebody else sharing with others what I did for them. And so I, I help steer my client to the right solution. And we, we were focused on performance and we impacted performance significantly. And the client was very happy about it. I, you know, I got other business elsewhere in the company and I got business outside of the company because they had a network or it was a neighbor down the street that's happened to me. Um, and so the go to market strategy should be, I'm here to help people perform improvements when I can. If I can't, I need to acknowledge that and tell them and may, and maybe ask them to consider me the next time something comes up because maybe learning would be part of the solution set. And I need to be on their side. I need to be the customer, talk about customer centricity. I need to be the customer's advocate and help them invest in worthy efforts and not in efforts that won't have a return. Or, yeah, we could train them, but I don't think it's going to do you very much good. You may get a, a dollar fifty back on your dollar, but you know, who does that? So what's what's the, you know, so I need to go for help clients utilize me and see me as a valuable resource who won't gouge them, who won't uh, sell them things that they don't really need, who will really help them discover and uncover what's really going on and what can we address with training and learning. Um, because many times learning is going to be required, but perhaps it's after they've revamped their process, not next week, but maybe in a couple of quarters once we've cleaned up our process, maybe then we can use me. If I can help them see that, they're more likely to come to me because I am could be a trusted advisor, a trusted resource for them because I'm not just selling stuff, I'm selling improvements. And if my stuff won't help them improve, then, then that's what I've got to do. That was a long answer. I told you I don't have any simple answers. Sorry. That's all right. Uh, I'll I'll read between. The, that's for me to figure out. To simplify is my job. If you tell me everything, then how how uh, will okay. All right. Um, I have two more questions for you. Uh, if you allow me. Uh, 
you can keep them as short or as long as you want uh, as long as i am not uh, taking up any more uh, of your time than you intend to spare for me again thank you uh, it's almost close to 2 hours so uh, we'll keep it as per your pace uh, my next question is uh, i think the first part will be in terms of uh, how do we create long term relationships with lnd uh my target audience speaking uh straight towards my target audience which is going to be uh either the c level or uh you know the lnd the the chief of chief learning officer. or chr chros right right uh, yeah so the chief uh, uh human relations officers um so i right? think really the thing is to be seen as a valued partner not just somebody selling things but somebody who is going to invest some of your time to help them figure out where learning can have an impact and where it, it's premature or whether or where it's not appropriate at all i think that's the secret to building those long term relationships with clients is doing good work or not doing work that's not going to have an impact um and that's tough to give up a potential sale when you could maybe make a sale but you shouldn't not if you were you know the owner of the 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 prospects company um so i think that that's really it is that you do good work and you avoid doing work that's not uh, significant and you're honest about that with them why you know i could sell you that you seem willing to buy but you know if it was me i wouldn't do it and they might say well gee okay that's different sales people don't usually talk like that why would you not and then explain your rationale and if you are thinking as a business person regardless of being on the sales side or the customer side i think that that just builds that kind of trusting relationship um where where they're going to trust you um and and that's the point you want to get at you want really you know you're not in something that's a short term one time sales and then you're done and off to the next thing you want to build a long term relationship with the client and you you get that by doing good work and building a trusting relationship uh all right uh my next question thank you i i don't have any follow ups on this uh i'll i think i'll take some more time to absorb in terms of how do we generate real value uh for the person who is uh standing opposite us uh rather as a partner not not standing opposite us uh how much so this is rather a technical question in terms of your entire experience in uh, the business front with lnd uh w- what uh range of or w- how many dollars does uh a company spend per year per person to train uh, or on lnd for for say their executives or their managers is there a number is there a ballpark figure i know it depends from industry to industry as well as the size of the company but is there a ballpark figure as what I, is termed as have, value for money i don't have what those numbers are but atd does they publish right. reports that uh, would tell you uh, different size companies and different right. industries and what in general it is but um again i i you know so i think it really kind of depends on you know that those are generalizations those are you know uh an aggregate of a bunch of different situations but every customer is different so what they're willing to spend again it depends on well what's the cost of doing nothing you know there's a cost of doing something and there's a cost of doing nothing and that's going to vary so you know a startup in certain industries um where the startup is very successful and has good cash flow they might be more willing to spend than a startup that doesn't have good cash flow um for, for whatever reasons uh, the poor internal cost controls or their revenues aren't big enough or whatever the situation is so i think that that that's one of those things that uh, you know you you can't i mean the general numbers can help you decide what industries to go after and what which industries to perhaps avoid but you've got to understand that those are uh uh aggregates of many different companies right. and so everybody's going to be a little bit different
Thank you. I don't have any other questions for you at this point. Uh, but I want to ask you uh, anything I can do for you for giving me two hours of your valuable time and uh, giving me so much knowledge uh, that I can actually have some actionable insights and uh, proceed in terms of what my goals are. Uh, thank you. Please, please let me know if you have anything in mind. I would do so, but so I ask that, you know, we record this so that we can share this with others. Um, you might want to look at it and edit out anything that you don't think is appropriate to be shared. But at this point in my career, um, I'm all about helping others become more performance based, more performance oriented in learning and development. And uh, my my goal in meeting with you and talking with you was that perhaps others can take something away from our discussion here and and apply it in their worlds. Now I have a, a saying that you know adopt what you can and adapt the rest. Just some of the things I've said may or may not be appropriate for other people. They may or may not be totally appropriate for you because we didn't have a chance to really investigate all your background and everything else that you're doing. So um, my comments are based upon what I have learned and what I believe is generally true, but I appreciate that there's always exceptions. And until, you know, if I knew the full story about you and your business and your situation, I might have given you different answers. So right. I was speaking in kind of broad generalities here um, in the hopes that other people can maybe hear this, consider it, decide, is there something there they can uh, adopt or do they need to adapt it or do they need to reject it? Because all of those are part of the options that people have. And I'm happy to have uh, had this conversation with you, and I hope that uh, it's useful to you. It is. It is. It. It already is. Uh, I also noticed another thing uh, on your LinkedIn profile. I see that uh, you've actively started posting a lot of content. Uh, now, how I found out about you was through your website, uh, and. Uh, I didn't get a chance to go through it in detail, but right from the gist of it, as I scrolled across the website, I had uh, uh, the insight that there is uh, a bountiful of knowledge within that website, which may not be accessible to uh, a lot of people, as many people as it can impact, right? Uh, and is that the reason why you are breaking that content down into chunks and putting it into into LinkedIn? Um, well, I so one of the my first mentor, um, the late Gary Rumler, um, reviewed my my second book, uh, Lean ISD, um, back in 1999, and I had been associated with him and worked with him on many projects at Motorola and subsequent to that. And he had done a lot for me as a mentor, a direct mentor. And I asked him, how could I ever repay you? And, and he was writing at the flip uh, on a, on a uh, whiteboard and he turned to me and he said, you can't. And then he went back to writing because he was joking. Yeah. And, and I said, <laughs> and, and, and he turned to me and he said, you're going to have to do what I had to do. I couldn't repay my mentors back either. All I can do is pay it forward. And and I knew him uh, because of work and through our professional association that we were members of and officers of. And I thought I would really work hard to pay him and many others back by paying it forward, by sharing what I have learned over the years so that people could decide to adopt, adapt, or reject, you know, what I had learned. And so I've spent a lot of time doing that. It hasn't necessarily generated business for me, although many of my clients were aware of what I have written and posted. And, and some of it may have been helpful in them making a decision to try me out and, 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 see if I could do something for them. But my goal wasn't really for marketing my business as much as it was to market the ideas that I had learned from others. Because 
you know, I've created a few things in my time, but most of it I have adopted or adapted from the work of others. And so I, part of what I try to do is point people to some of my mentors, some of my sources, so they can go to the source. They can hear what I've done with it, but they can go to the source as well and learn from those sources. Because I think there's a lot of uh, rich history about what works under what conditions and what doesn't work under other conditions. And I think that that's all part of what we are trying to do. One of the things that I learned is that it's just as important for us to help our clients understand when learning isn't part of the solution as it is to what takes what does it take to create good learning? Because if we do learning that doesn't really have an impact, we've wasted their money and and their time. And okay. so it's important to help clients understand that, to look beyond learning, because it's not all about learning. It's about performance when you're dealing with enterprise learning. The education system, that's a whole nother thing. But in enterprise learning, it's really about helping people learn to perform better. It's not what they know, it's what they can do. And whether that that new capability of doing is useful to the business in terms of advancing its agenda. Right. Uh, please excuse me, I'm just making a few notes. Great, thanks a lot for your time, Guy. Uh, I don't have any other questions, but yeah, uh, still want to uh, make one last statement. I did ask for uh, some words of wisdom that you'd want to share with me apart from everything. I know you everything in this last two hours has been words of wisdom, but anything else you want to share with me uh, before we close the call? No, I, I, I think we've kind of covered it unless you had something specific that you wanted to, but uh, but I think that uh, one, one of the things that I did want to talk about was, and I think I've covered it, is you know, this whole need to, to simulate and gamify authentic performance. So if you're if you're anchored to here's the process, here's the task, here's the outputs, here's the requirements for the outputs, here's the requirements for the tasks. Now simulate that, gamify that. And that's that's near that will lead to learning that's near transfer. It's going to be easier for the learner to learn it because they experienced it. And when they go back to the job, it's close enough what they learn to what the job actually looks like. And that's re really critical um, that we avoid far transfer learning and really focus our efforts on near transfer learning. And that's up to those of us that construct the learning experience. Yeah. So uh, we as an organization cater to both uh, the far and the near. Uh, the, the difference that essentially falls in all of this is the pricing itself. So if uh, so, this was an off the shelf solution that I showed you, this is fairly cheaper than uh, getting a custom solution. Of course, we do have technology to build custom solutions uh, for our clients. However, they are very highly priced, uh, which may be a cause of concern for uh, smaller enterprises, right? Uh, but of Certainly. course, you did tell me you did tell me to go after organizations uh, which have a better or a rich cash flow, uh, at least to get started off with, because I'm confident in terms of the service that our organization can provide. Word of mouth would be a, uh, a very tangible approach in terms of growth of the organization. I do believe in the product that we are uh, selling and the impact that it's having uh, in all the markets we are already present in. Yeah, so when you've got off the shelf uh, content, again, that my approach to dealing with that is to help clients bookend it. You can create templates to help them bookend on the front end to set the learner up so they understand why they're learning this, then have them learn it. And then at the back end, you can create templates that help their them and their organization, their supervisor or their peers to create authentic practice and feedback, which is them applying it in their real work. And then having the supervisor or somebody pay attention to what the learner is doing and giving them feedback. And, and so there's a way to take off the shelf content and bookend it and I've got articles on my on my website and my blogs 
uh, on bookending that would help people do that. And I've, and I've encouraged vendors to create those templates and either work with their clients to, to use those templates to create the content or to give the templates to the client and let them create it, which is, you know, cheaper for them. Um, and again, it, if the risks are high, then maybe they do want help in making sure that they've created a good bookends on the front and the back end of generic content. Um, so there's a there's a there's a way to use all of that. Many of my clients have libraries of content, and we need to help them make what would be far transfer into near transfer, uh, because. Far transfer, you know, the numbers on far, I don't know what the numbers exactly are, but far transfer is less likely to transfer than near transfer content. And so that's that's part of what the learning experience got to be had. Now, if I'm a really motivated learner, I'll take uh, your library of content and I'll learn from it and I'll figure out how to apply it on myself. But not everybody is that motivated to do that. Right. So absolutely, it's, it's like the golf and and. Uh, and uh, tennis example, you know, somebody will really work hard to get that grip right, and they'll they'll ask others to observe them and see if they've got it right. They'll second and triple check themselves as they're performing to see if they're really doing it right. They'll they'll be more conscious of that. Most of us are not like that. You know, we're lazy learners. We like to be spoon fed, and you know, then we may use it, we may not. Um, but that, but I think so. I think that that's that's the that's one of the challenges for us and for our customers. Uh, how do how do uh, C level executives in enterprise organizations uh, prioritize uh, L and D as a cadence or as something that has to be done regularly for their talent? I think it it's it's varies all over the place. So uh, some L and D organizations, unfortunately, decide what they're going to work on and they work on it. Others are more aligned with the business strategies. If you go to the enterprise and they have a strategy, and there's a strategy for sales, and there's a strategy for marketing, and there's a strategy for finance, and there's a strategy for manufacturing or merchandising. Um, successful learning and development organizations will work with each of those functions to figure out how they can help the other function implement and be successful in their strategic endeavors but again a lot of organizations and this is i don't under i don't understand why but it's part of the culture i guess of that enterprise where learning just creates stuff buys stuff and puts it in the lms and pushes it out and it's not necessarily aligned to the critical business issues uh, of the business. And so there are ways to get, you know, some, for, for learning and development organizations to get better aligned with the executives and understand what keeps them up at night. Well, how can we help rather than just them dreaming up or following trends? um and thinking that they're serving the organization well that way i think it's always better to whether it's a formal alignment mechanism or an informal alignment mechanism one of the big challenges of l d as i have seen it for my 45 years is being aligned to the top of the business and being involved in the strategic critical strategic initiatives and the critical current state operational needs of their organization and make sure they're working on that and those might be smaller target audiences but the payback for addressing them successfully is much higher than organizations that are left to do you know whatever they think they need to do whether and that may be responding when the next request comes in whether it's a big deal or a little deal um most l d organizations and their alignment to the to the enterprise are out of control and they're not really tightly aligned and really serving the the critical needs of the business, and that's a that's a huge challenge, I think. So the the answer is it's all over the map, unfortunately. Can you highlight some board uh, some boardroom topics of discussion uh, that may take place, which are aligned to uh, L and D initiatives? Uh, 
Do you want me to elaborate on this question? No, I understand it. I, I just was talking with a former client that I did work with for six years ago, and he has two major needs. One of them is for a recently revamped set of processes in the pro procurement world. And there's a new process and new tools, and they need to Digital help transformation. learn how to do that. Yeah, and so that's a critical, huge issue uh, procurement is. I mean, that's where, the, that's where the money goes, right? You bring it in in revenues, and you spend some of it, and the rest of it's profit. Well, procurement controls all the money that goes out. And the other initiative he had was uh, another function. I won't name it. Um, that's just at the pro at the point of deciding that they need to blow it up and start all over again. They need to totally revamp what they're doing because what they've been doing is totally inadequate to the needs of the business. Well, they're too early Change in the process. Management. Yeah, uh, well, uh, so they're too early in the process for us to figure out where, you know, they got to change management group. This is a huge company. And, and what what can learning do? Learning is going to create learning for people. Well, nobody knows what that learning is going to be, how many people are involved, what the job titles are going to be, because all of that is subject to be changed. And but but it's on my client's radar screen. He knows that that's coming. It's just not here yet. And he's got to have to be ready to address them in a timely fashion. But right now it's too early. He can go and introduce himself to those people, make sure that they know about him and that he's standing at the ready to help them whenever the time is right. But the first situation, the time is right, right now. And he needs to act to begin to help people with implementing their new process. They haven't put it all in place yet, but they've made all the big decisions about what the tool is, what the process is gonna be, but they haven't begun to cut over to the new world yet. And so that's coming. And so there's there's different situations. And, and he, like many of my other clients, not all of them, they're, they're, in, they're tied at the hip to the business leaders who, are, who have seen L&D do good work and know that L&D has a place in these big changes and these big initiatives and these things are strategically important. And some L&D organizations are fearful of getting involved in those kinds of projects because they are big, they are hairy, they are scary, they're significant. And if you don't do real well, everybody will know. And you may not be here in the next quarter. They'll find somebody else who, so, they tend to shy away from that. They don't think that they and their organizations are at a point of competence where they can take on those big, huge, hairy projects uh, where maybe things aren't very clear and it's chock full of ambiguity. And how do we get in there and help navigate our way to help uh, uh, the change be uh, successful? So you know, organ functions like L&D are a reflection of their leadership and some leaders are timid and don't want to get involved in those things unless they're dragged into them. Others are boldly going forward where no one else has gone before and they want to get involved in those things because they have confidence in their organization's ability to pull it off. And there's huge differences here across the L&D landscape here. You can't generalize and say they're all alike. So the so those organizations that are know what the major issues are at the top of the organization it's because they are aligned they have connections with the people who are at the top of the organization they're getting you know the word early that such and such is going on and they might come talking to you and now you can begin to get your team ready to address that function because merchandising is different than finance you know, and so what do we know about merchandising? Well, we may not know a thing about merchandising. Maybe we better get smart about merchandising because that's different than finance and sales and marketing who we've been serving. And now we've got a new function to deal with and we need to have some foundational knowledge about that so we're not just coming in blind. Um, and so those are some of the challenges I think that learning and development organizations 
make. They've got to, one, be aligned, and two, they've got to be competent and addressing what those issues are that come their way after you get aligned. So you, you've got to perhaps get competent first and then get yourself aligned. But, uh, you know, it's better to get aligned and be truthful about what your capabilities, your competences are as an organization. Um, and perhaps the L&D organization needs to bring in, bring in vendors who can bring in the expertise that's needed here because they don't have it right now. So, again, that's about building internal trust as an internal provider to the leadership of your organization. Um, large organizations, that's just much more difficult to do. Smaller organizations, it's a little bit easy it, to have an informal alignment mechanism. You know, going to lunch with the right person every once a month is probably sufficient in some organizations. In others, it's totally inadequate. Got it. Uh, I'm going to try to keep this uh, short. Just a few more questions, if you don't mind. I do I have your That's permission. Okay. Uh, my next question is, uh, how do I, I so how do I identify these early adopters in terms of leaders uh, who would want to uh, invest in L and D and who would want to try my product? How do I identify those in a company? There are leaders who are timid and hesitant. There are those who are early adopters, right? Uh, right. How do I identify them? What are their traits? I, you know, so you're, you're, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to call on them and ask them, you know, which which are you, the early adapter yeah. or the laggard? Um, but uh, so one of the strategies that salespeople use is they find somebody inside a company who can help bring bring them in. So that's one of the things about the spin sales methodology is you may be calling on a person that's not got the final decision, but they have their they're part of the group that has the need. But they those. don't get to make the decision. So you look for them to be your champion. And so what you're doing is you're just trying to make inroads into somebody to see what they know and who else they know. And can they introduce you to the other people so that you can figure out whether or not this company or this leadership team or the leader themselves believes in learning because a lot of leaders don't believe in learning. It's a motherhood issue. We should do it because everybody's doing it. But when times get tough, we ax them. We cut their budget. We cut their staff. We'll rebuild later on because it's just a good thing to do. Those are leaders that have probably not seen uh, adequate returns for their investments in learning. But you got to have learning if you're going to hire people in because they want to know what what am I what are you going to do for me to help me learn and grow and develop. And so we've got to have an answer for them. Um, but it's but they don't really believe it. So their their actions uh, don't connect with what their true beliefs are. But you but there are leaders out there who understand when applied appropriately, learning can be have a significant impact. And the only way to get to that is to just penetrate into an account and ask the questions, build some trust. Uh, you know, maybe it requires giving some things away here at, at cost or below and getting to learn the company. There was a thing called um, the Blue Sheet back in the 1980s. Uh, salespeople, I forget what company uh, did this, but they had a thing called the Blue Sheet where this, the sales team would sit there and fill out this big chart. And it was to say, what do we know about this account? What do we know and what don't we know? If we can't fill in that cell that says, who are the decision makers for major purchases? If we don't know what names to put in there, that's what we've got to go find out. So we've got to go back they to our complete sources. profiling. It is. It's profiling. Yeah, it's profile. Well, yeah, and so it's basically understanding what's their what's their purchasing decision process. Who's involved? You know, it's mapping all that out because when you're going into a new client, a new prospect, you don't know the answers to those things. So one of the things you're trying to find out is that am I talking to the person who can make the decision or not? Because otherwise, I'm kind of wasting my time trying to sell them the whole thing. I just need to sell them on helping me sell to the right people. Can they help me and bring me in and get me introduced to the right people so that I can understand enough about the account in order to be able to see what are the issues that I should be helping them 
Because if I'm going in there and pitching learning for the sake of learning, well, you know, in good times, we might do that. In bad times, we're not going to do that. So what are the significant business issues, the critical business issues uh, that we need to talk about? Because I the more specific I am talking about what I can do for them on their procurement processes versus merchandising, you know, I need to target what my pitch is and talk more things. It's really the near far transfer thing. I learning, well, learning for the sake of learning, that's fire transfer. But if I can talk to you about what we've done for other procurement organizations and big companies like you, I, I can get an inroad into talking to the right people. So I have to have enough knowledge about an account, an enterprise, to know what's the hot issues there, what functions are involved. Is this cross-functional? Is this inside one function? So I need to understand more of that so I understand who the players are so that I can craft my my pitch to to address their needs and not be some generic bunch of statements about learning is good and, and wonderful yeah. and you should try it got it uh, i do have more questions for you but i'm oh, going to let you go now go ahead <laughs> i don't i don't think it would be fair uh i think uh, something that i need to do on my part is take back everything that you have uh, told me over the next uh, over the last two hours and actually implement it uh, and I'd be happy to share my learnings with you after my implementation if that's something you'd be interested in uh, yeah I think that if you if you know so if it would be helpful to others you know so what did you take what did you what did you adopt what did you adapt what did you reject and you know why and how you see yourself taking any of this as as a meaningful help to you that might help others so again that's that's what i'm all about at this stage in my career here i'm winding down i'm i i was i was retired until yesterday and now i'm unretired yeah. for a while congratulations on that is that what you wanted though uh yeah because retirement is kind of boring and you know when you have passion about what you do and i've been doing it for a long time i like to see other people be successful with this so Part of my gig is going to be to help a brand new staff adopt or adapt my methodologies and uh, so that they can continue and do this themselves without me. That's amazing. Good luck with that. Well, thank you.